Hello and welcome to Material Girls, a scholarly podcast about popular culture. I'm Hannah McGregor. And I'm Marcel Cosman. And today we are talking about James Cameron's 2009 sci-fi epic Avatar, which, Marcel, you and I both just watched for the first time this week. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yep. Uh huh. We sure did. I'm glad that I decided to because remember I texted and was like, should I watch it? (laughs) And I was like, I mean, if you feel like it, sure. (laughs) And then you did and you texted me while you did and it was fun. It was a wild ride. So I know that this new podcast of ours is about material culture. So we're probably going to talk about like the production of Avatar you know, rather than doing like an analysis of the content. Yeah, that's right. So before we do that, I've just, I've got to get some stuff off my chest about how totally <laughs> bonkers this movie is. <laughs> uh, okay. So so I compiled, I wanted to make a top 10 list, but it was, I'm not going to lie, I had to skip a lot of the movie because it was unnecessarily long. Oh, because it's so boring to watch when you're not in a movie theater because so many of the scenes are just them flying around on dragons for like 15 minutes. <laughs> like the war scene. Anyway, we'll get, we'll, mm. we'll, I'm sure we'll talk to it. We'll, mm. we'll talk about it. So what I did is I made a top five list of things about which I can say absolutely nothing more intellectual than, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> Good. I'm ready. Okay, so number five, our hero's name, okay, the protagonist of the movie, his name yeah. is Jake Sully, uh-huh. but the Navi call him Jake Sully. They call him Jake Sully. Oh, sorry, you're right. Jake <laughs> Sully. But it's only clear that they're, like, collapsing his first his his first name and his surname together into one if you're watching the movie with subtitles. So it, like, does it, it's not... <laughs> It, like, doesn't serve. You're supposed to hear that they don't understand surnames, sort of from how they say it. But you can't, because they're they're just saying Jake Sully, and his name is Jake Sully, so it's like, how do you know they're not, how do do you know? Hey, speaking of subtitles. So number four, speaking of subtitles, the captions for the Navi language appear in yellow papyrus font. Truly. Like, it's (laughs) really the font is so embarrassing. It is instantly recognizable it is the font high schoolers across north america use for every single history class presentation on on ancient egypt you know it if you're listening oh, yeah. and you're like i oh, did yeah. a presentation on ancient egypt in the late 90s and the early aughts <laughs> and it's yellow the way that they designed these subtitles just to be like what looks foreign okay important important intervention Coach has just informed us that there's an SNL skit about this, so we're pausing the recording immediately to go and watch. I and, can't believe uh, you just called it a skit. It. We're not editing that out. Leave it in. Never take it out. Is it not a skit? It's a sketch. I, not funny. Not funny because you made a mistake. Funny because comedy nerds care. Comedy nerds. Okay, number three. The Navi practice lifelong heterosexual monogamy even though they literally penetrate every other living thing around them. I've made it with you, and I'll mate with you for life, except for literally everything, which I will be putting my braid dick in. Everything. Everything. It's... I'm going to fuck the entire world. I'm going to fuck this horse. I'm going to fuck this horse right now. But you and I were mated for life. <laughs> Wait, in, the, what? in the eyes of this tree. But I'm going to fuck that dragon. I'm going to fuck that tree. I'm going to fuck that tree. <laughs> That tree observed that we're made of for life. And also, I'm going to fuck that tree. <laughs> oh, my God. Hey, okay. speaking of dragons. Speaking of dragons, number two. This one, oh, my God. At this point, I had consumed an entire bottle of wine, so I actually had to pause and go back because I thought I thought for sure I've, I misread <laughs> and misheard. <laughs> So our our antagonist, the big bad military man, whose Who's real name literally I, his only motivation is I hate natives. I think, yeah, he. I it's simply, just, I simply hate them. It's just straight up colonial racism. Like that's his whole deal. It's his whole vibe. <laughs> okay, I've got to say it seriously. His call sign. <laughs> his call sign is Papa Dragon. Yeah. <laughs> 
And you know what? So is mine. Moving forward, you are going to have to call me that all the time. But I already call you Daddy Dragon. Isn't that enough? <laughs> no, yeah, actually, it's better. Yeah. It's better. It's better. Thank you. There's something really sinister about Papa Dragon that... Um... You know why? <laughs> He's going to fuck that tree. <laughs> okay. Okay. And so the number one, you guys. God. Sigourney Weaver, her character Grace, her avatar is a hot teen. <laughs> so embarrassing she's got this weird headband the first time you see her in her avatar form she's wearing a jersey and playing basketball and it's like it's embarrassing for the movie but it's also embarrassing for sigourney weaver's character like you're an adult scientist have some self-respect and the like the look that she gives jake Sully, which is like i know right <laughs> like no <laughs> no grace yeah, have you seen this cool bot I've got? Weird. It's weird. <laughs> like, I want to talk about the genetic logic of, like, we spliced your DNA into this into this Navi body. And so the nerd looks like a nerd as a Navi because he's genetically a nerd. <laughs> he's genetically what? a nerd. <laughs> How do you think genes work? But then what does that mean for Sigourney, for Sigourney Weaver's character? She's like genetically a hot teen. Yeah. <laughs> I think we can all agree Sigourney Weaver's genetically a hot teen. Yeah. Listen, yeah. Marcel, everything about this movie is profoundly bonkers. And that's not beside the point, because I think it's deep silliness has to be part of our conversation. But... We've got to leave it aside for a moment and ask, hey, this is a very silly movie. Why did people like it so much? Why did this? Who let this happen? I have an answer for that. And we're going to find out in the next segment. We must. Let's go. All right. Enough about content. Forget it. It's time for context. Also known as why this, why now? our segment in which we consider the material conditions for our object of study and why the heck it became or was so zeitgeisty. Why this, why now is a really fun question when it comes to Avatar as a movie. Wait, wait, wait. Do you mean fun literally or fun academically? Because those are not always the same I thing. I mean fun academically! <laughs> I had a feeling. Wow. So listeners. Wow. So mean. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay. About myself. It's fun. It's scare quotes. Fun. Fun. Because one of the most oft repeated stories about the production of this movie is that James Cameron originally planned on making it way earlier than he did. He wrote the original treatment for the movie in 1994 and his plan was to start production in 1997 as soon as he was done with Titanic. Like, it was his next project. But he tested the motion capture, and it wasn't where he wanted it to be. Like, he had this very specific image that he wanted to make a sci-fi epic where the protagonists were these, like, fake creatures. And he was like, the motion capture's not good enough. So the short answer is Avatar was zeitgeisty in 2009 because that's when James Cameron made Avatar and they spent <laughs> $150 million on promotion. Like, the weird thing about talking about material culture and the zeitgeist is that we have to recognize that at a certain point, if an incredibly rich man decides we're all into something, we're all into that thing now. For context, $150 million is what the Barbie movie's marketing budget was in 2023. Oh, oh, wow. And we're okay. talking $150 million in 2009 money. Yeah. So it was like an unprecedentedly large marketing budget on top of an unprecedentedly large production budget. Like a rich guy decided that this is the thing he wanted to do. And then he spent an unfathomable quantity of money telling us all that we had to watch it. And everybody did. I know we're probably going to get to this, but like, did he make the money back? Adjusted for inflation, it's the second highest grossing movie of all time. It was the first movie ever to break the $2 billion gross mark. 
to ever make more than $2 billion. Well, that is gross. It is now. And then they re-released it to theaters to get people amped for the sequel, Avatar The Way of Water. And it's very, it's really close to $3 billion now. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Marcel, he made it back. He made it he back. Made it back. Woo. It's a real pull yourself up by your bootstraps kind of story, isn't it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so let's do a little context. Because to understand this movie, we really just need to understand who this rich guy is and how he made it. Because that's really that's really what's going on here. And so <laughs> James Cameron, you may have heard of him. He made a boat movie one time, he right? He also made Titanic. That was uh, him. that's it. Mm-hmm. He's extremely horny for the ocean. He, <laughs> like, he's made a bunch of documentaries about the ocean. He's a big personal submersibles guy. When the submersible was was missing, I remember, like, James Cameron being like, oh, I've done submersibles and that He's kind the of- only person ever to have done a solo mission to the bottom of the Marianas Trench. This guy is horny for the ocean. And he is unbelievably rich, so he's probably building himself an Atlantis at the bottom of the ocean right now. No one no one would know because... And we wouldn't know because none of the rest of us can get down there. That's right. <laughs> okay, so he is arguably one of the two quintessential directors of the modern blockbuster, which is like mega movies with mega budgets that are framed as being for literally everyone and everyone's supposed to go see them. That's sort of the idea of the blockbuster. Like, it's not for a niche. It's for absolutely everybody. We put a huge amount of money into it, and everybody everybody sees it. Just a side note about James Cameron. Coach sent me this amazing article in Bustle called Why Are We So Horny for Blue Aliens by <laughs> Chloe Joe, And yeah. it's really, really good. It does talk about Avatar, obviously. <laughs> At one point, <laughs> the author links the fetish towards blue aliens to humanity's erotic fascination with water (laughs) and writes of James Cameron, quote, if anyone wants to fuck a lake, it's that guy, end quote. So (laughs) anyway, that's really good. So it's not just you. It's it is it is clear to anybody. It's well established. It's well established. James Cameron canon that he wants to fuck a body of water. The bigger, the better. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And probably the first Avatar movie would have been largely about the ocean, but they weren't ready for water animation. That's a big part of why he waited so long before making The Way of Water. That's why there was another huge gap. Oh, okay. So so he saw the Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire and was like, mm, not yet. He's like, Sim- simply not ready. Simply not ready. Okay, very good. Very good. All right. So. The specific technology he was waiting to be ready is motion capture. I found a fabulous article about motion capture published in the late 1990s, which was really (laughs) fun because it was when it was brand new and people were being like, is this art? Hard to say. Oh, wow. Okay. Really good. Really good. But it included just a really handy little quote from it from a white paper on the topic. Okay, wait. Please explain to listeners what a white paper is. I only know them in the context of the government. A white paper is like a, like a, essentially like a policy document explaining the context of something. So this is like when this is a brand new technology and people are still grappling with it. So this is a quote from Scott Dyer, Jeff Martin, and John Zulauf, who describe it as, quote, involving measuring an object's position and orientation in physical space, then recording that information in a computer usable form. Objects of interest include human and non-human bodies, facial expressions, camera or light positions, and other elements in a scene, end quote. So it's like you're recording it, but you're recording it for a computer to use so that the computer can stick shit on top of it if it wants. Why were they developing this technology? What was the... Marcel! I know. Was it for porn? (laughs) Take take a quick guess. What (laughs) mm, incredibly well-funded sort of sector of our society tends to innovate new technologies? It's the military. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Motion capture was created for military use and like a lot of other kinds of technologies, it then made its way into entertainment. It's obviously huge now. There basically isn't a modern blockbuster that isn't using some kind of motion capture. But it's most obvious when they have like human actors playing supernatural creatures like 
Gollum or the Hulk. So like it allows you to like have a human actor acting alongside the other human actors and then in post turn that actor into a computer generated character. Gollum, flawless. Yeah. Impeccable. Why didn't Peter Jackson participate in this in this process? Oh, Marcel. Am I getting ahead of am I getting oh, ahead of Marcel, us? Marcel, you are getting ahead okay, of us. Okay, okay, okay. We'll put a we'll put a pin in Peter Jackson. Okay, okay, okay. Fuck it. Let's get to him right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> in order to do the motion capture work that he wanted to do for Avatar, James Cameron partnered with Weta Digital which is a New Zealand-based FX company that Peter Jackson started in 1993 to make the movie Heavenly Creatures. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And is this is this the company that made that that did the motion capture animation stuff for for Lord of the Rings? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. So that's how Gollum takes us to Avatar. Okay. So the technology was like progressing really rapidly. I mean, it's continuing to progress really rapidly because of the military. At this point, it's because white men really think it's cool and put a lot of money into it. Okay. Like okay. Peter Jackson and James Cameron are bonkers rich. And they think the most important thing they can be doing with their money is either going to the bottom of the ocean or making computer generated aliens that people are going to want to fuck. Okay. So that is what they. <laughs> That's what they're up to. Um, <laughs> but like the production of Avatar mm -hmm. required creating new technologies to do it. Whoa. OK. That's kind of one of the things that Cameron's famous for as a director is that like he has an image. And so he like helps create new technologies that will allow the thing that he wants to do to become possible. Okay. So it wasn't just he sat around twiddling his thumbs waiting for digital FX to be ready. He was like participating in its readiness. And there were a bunch of other, like he patented a kind of 3D camera that let them film in unprecedented 3D. This is a dimension of the movie we missed out on watching it at home. Oh my God. Yeah, it was in 3D. And it was such a huge success for 3D that it actually is linked to the rising popularity of at-home 3D compatible TVs. I remember those. That whole industry emerged basically because people wanted to watch Avatar at home. <laughs> no, I can't. This is... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They created like the biggest soundstage that had ever been made so that they could do motion capture at like unprecedented scales, like with whole whole scenes with lots and lots of actors. They created this virtual camera system where it's like basically a sort of an augmented reality situation. Think Pokemon Go. So okay. the actors are acting on the soundstage and then what he can see as he's directing, like through his screen, is them as avatars. Like it superimposes it so that he can see what it will look like. Like it's not, you know, it's not a, not rendered like it will be in the final one. But OK, OK. Yeah. Yeah. So Microsoft. Mm -hmm. Bill Gates, another incredibly rich white man. Built for James Cameron a whole new cloud computing system that they named Gaia. Because I guess all these guys think they're helping the environment. Unclear. Just just to handle the sheer quantity of data involved in making a movie like this. Like, these guys invented a lot of new technology to make Avatar possible. So there's this quote from the Wikipedia article about Avatar that I'm really horny for. And Marcel, I'm going to read it to you because it's got too many mean words for me to make you read it to me. <laughs> Thank you. That's nice of you. Quote, to render Avatar, that's like, you know, the actual processing of all of the, the digital effects. To render Avatar, Wita used a 930 meter squared or 10,000 square foot server farm, making use of 4,000 Hewlett Packard servers with 35,000 processor cores with 104 terabytes of RAM and three petabytes of network area storage running Ubuntu Linux, Grid Engine Cluster Manager, and two of the animation software and managers, Pixar's Render Man and Pixar's Alfred Q Management System. The Render Farm occupies the 193rd to 197th spots in the top 500 list of the world's most powerful supercomputers, end quote. 
They really wanted to make these aliens fuckable. I'm beside myself. Get ready, Marcel. It's going to get sillier. No, 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 no. I don't know if I can. I don't know. I don't know if I can do it. (laughs) So obviously Cameron's goal with the visual effects was the closest to hyperrealism he could achieve. Mm -hmm. But he was also really invested in the hyperrealism of the world building. So he hired a linguist to create the Navi language. Mm -hmm. It is a fully structured existing language that you can learn. Like Elvish. Like Elvish with a growing vocabulary. That language was created before they even started interviewing the actors. So he made the actors speak it in auditions. Okay. (laughs) He also, even though they were good. This is my favorite one. This is my favorite one. They recorded most of it on a soundstage, obviously, because it's all just it's all just computers. But he wanted the actors to, like, get a jungly vibe. And so he sent them to a jungle. (laughs) Okay, so this is a quote from James Cameron. We did a sense memory experiment in Hawaii. We trekked around the rainforest for three days, building campfires and cooking fish, trying to live tribally. No, can't, no. End quote. So obviously, like, his sense of, like, we're building a world here was, like, really vital. And the world he thought he was building was, like, a fucking an updated version of Pocahontas movie. Like, like he's, like, new world explorer, rich white man. Like, this is the level of this. It's, like, 100% colonial, neo-colonialism. 100%. No jokes about it. The story is about a white man who goes and saves the natives. And because there were no natives left for him to save, he invented some. Mm -mm, mm -mm, Yeah, I don't. Okay. Okay. So really central to like realism is is really central to his understanding of what the movie is. I just think that James Cameron and I have different interpretations of the term realism is the only thing. But keep going. I mean, he doesn't use realism. I'm using realism. Like, ver- verisimilitude. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, here's another quote from him. And this is about his goal with the computer-generated characters. He said, quote, Ideally, at the end of the day, the audience has no idea which they're looking at. End quote. Like, what's, what's real and what's constructed. That is his goal. He wants the lines between what's real and what is computer generated to be so fully blurred that the audience cannot tell what has been computer generated and what is real. Mhm. Mhm. I don't I don't I don't think he I I wouldn't say that he accomplished it, but you know what? It's 2023. I mean, it's 2023. The movie is 14 years old and it still looks pretty good. And it looks better and better all the time really the limitation at this point is like the computational power so the stronger our computers get the more sort of granular the like rendering of these digital effects can be okay so here's the here's the pivot so much money is going into computer generated effects motion capture we talked about you know the technology there's obviously humans involved as well and the fx industry has some problems that have been i know coming to the forefront in the last few years so this is my last crucial piece of context is the shit that is going down in the like special effects computer fx digital effects world okay okay i'm ready so the first is labor issues Again, I must say, what? (laughs) Yeah, I know. Shocking. Okay, so here's a quote from a BBC article about the issues with virtual effects companies. Quote, Untenable working hours, tight deadlines, and late stage edits have allegedly caused rampant burnout for VFX company employees trying to keep up with the unrealistic expectations from studios producing an increasing number of CGI heavy movies and series. Superhero projects have reportedly caused the biggest headache with Marvel Studios, a subsidiary of Walt Disney Studios, being called out by VFX artists through news outlets and otherwise, claiming execs make increasingly complex demands 
demands, but don't adequately compensate for the multiple new renderings that come from endless studio notes, end quote. So everybody working in the VFX industry is like, Disney and Marvel are the real nightmare. And the thing is, because they're making like most of the movies now, they can just lowball everybody. They have incredibly exploitative practices when it comes to how much they pay people to do all of this rendering. James Cameron, apparently good. Like oh. FX people like him because he he's not like, here we filmed a thing, now make it look cool for us. Which I, I think I think how like Marvel movies treat it. He's like, I only made this movie once the motion capture was ready. You know, he he cares more. Like he he ha- and maybe has a bit more of an understanding of like what goes into the process because he's been so involved in the development of the technology. Yeah. And he like worked with, you know, a company owned by his friend, you know, like Wita is really sort of the top tier company. And, and so so Wita is Weed is good. <laughs> is that is that what I'm hearing you say? They're good at doing this. OK. They're bad at some other things. So the FX industry is, you will be really surprised to find out, like, really sexist. Again, I must. What? I know. And pretty racist. Ooh, what? Yeah, Double yeah, yeah. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So in 2020, there was a investigation into uh, the workplace culture at WETA after Basically, a, a whistleblower <laughs> went to a, a journalist in New Zealand and was like, it's bad here. Marcel, I'm going to ask you to read this quote from Wikipedia about the workplace culture issues <laughs> at WETA, WETA FX. You got it. Quote, in their testimonies, workers identified the existence of a male-only pornographic mailing list called Caveman, which originated in 2002 following a company-wide tradition known as Porn Friday, and continued to circulate until 2015. Several reports also alleged that the company's IT systems required upgrades in order to accommodate the volume of pornographic content hosted on the company intranet. In addition, to numerous allegations of sexual harassment, bullying, intimidation, misogyny, and homophobia, end quote. Okay, so not a good place to work? So here's here's another quote. Again, Wikipedia. Bless you, Wikipedia. This is about the design of Neytiri. Quote, Cameron described Neytiri as his Pocahontas, saying that his plot line followed the historical story of a, quote, white outsider who falls in love with the chief's daughter, who becomes his guide to the tribe and to their special bond with nature. End quote within the quote. That's the end of Cameron talking. But this is me continuing the Wikipedia quote. Cameron felt that whether or not the Jake and Natiri love story would be perceived as believable partially hinged on the physical attractiveness of Natiri's alien appearance, which was developed by considering her appeal to the all-male crew of artists, end quote. That's just, just as a reminder, the all-male, the all-male crew of artists working at the company that had so much porn on its servers that they kept having to upgrade them. Was Avatar delayed because the motion capture wasn't ready or was it delayed because the computers kept crashing because it was too much porn? This is why we can't have nice things, because when you're not being driven to absolute burnout by your employer, you are crashing the servers with your Porn Friday activities. Yeah. And I hate it. Yeah, because because the notion of what a good workplace is going to be like is defined by a bunch of white tech bros who are like, good, we want like good, like a good workplace. So ping pong tables and porn, you know, good workplace things. Okay, the last thing. This is uh, about the servers, that server farm. Remember that Mm -hmm. huge server farm? Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Wita has a huge server farm. Shout out to friend of the podcast and board of trustees member Jan for helping me out with the research on this particular topic. Uh, Wita FX's server farms, apparently they now use Amazon cloud servers. 
that's sorry, the cloud should not distract you from the fact that they are physically located somewhere. It's just that they might not still be physically located in New Zealand. They'll just be physically located wherever Amazon's server farms are. But when Avatar was being made, the server farm was in New Zealand. And fun fact, some of you probably know this, some of you don't. Server farms are environmentally devastating. Oh. Because, hey, Marcel, you know that thing that happens where your laptop has been running for a while and it starts to get hot and then the fan starts to go? So picture that with 4,000 servers running simultaneously in a 10,000 square foot facility. They require an enormous amount of cooling power. And that cooling power, which is like basically constantly mega air conditioning a huge mansion. Yeah. It's really bad. Also, apparently it fucks up birds. Well, yeah. Yeah. They tend to build the server farms in cold climates so that the coldness of the climate will contribute to the cooling. Oh, that's nice. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. But they're, um, they really have an enormous ecological footprint, which is, let's just say, ironic considering the subject matter of the movie. I was going to ask. <laughs> but... You'll be relieved to hear that Cameron insisted that only vegan meals were served on set. For the environment. I mean, they ate fish when they were in the jungle, but that's because they were trying to live tribally. I'm so mad. Everything about this movie is so weird. And it's like the more you read, the weirder it gets. Yeah. What is really interesting to me uh -huh. as a, you know, scholar of material culture, is how much of the marketing and paratext around these movies focuses on their production. You can find a bajillion behind-the-scenes featurettes. You can find so many videos of Zoe Saldana covered in dots with a camera on her head. Like, it's everywhere. So the goal of Avatar is to create an environment that is, like, immersively real-seeming, but at the same time, we are constantly being told about how hard and expensive and complicated it was to make it so that you never forget that that impression of realness was produced through a series of elaborate forms of mediation. This is like this is like the film version of, you know, when your house is really clean, you don't notice that it's clean. Unless somebody's constantly walking around and pointing out, like, I cleaned that just now. See that? I scrubbed that. Do you see this? Yeah. I polished that. Do you see this? I swept the floor. Do you see this? A hundred percent. Like, <laughs> the point is that you shouldn't be able to tell the difference between what's generated and what's real. But in order for you to be impressed with how hard we worked to create that, we are going to tell you every fucking detail <laughs> about how we made this real. Mm. Every technological detail, we're going to try to keep the sort of labor context on the DL. Yeah. <laughs> labor context, and I'm guessing also maybe the environmental context. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not, to talk, we're not going to talk about the environment, but we're going to talk about big computer. Yeah. Computer's really big, but don't ask. Don't ask how hot it is. <laughs> computer's so big. Computer's so big or so hot. So in order to understand what's going on here with this like relationship between like realism and technology, I think we need some theory. Oh, what a good idea, Hannah. Let's do it. It's theory time. And today we are going to talk about J. David Bolter and Richard Grusin's iconic 2000 book, Remediation, Understanding New Media. Marcel, is this a book you're familiar with? Not at all. So here's their basic thesis. Here's, here's what they're talking about when they talk about remediation. They argue that when we talk about new media, especially digital media, we tend to fixate on its newness, the ways in which it is, it is different from older media. But Bolter and Grusin argue that new media generally positions itself explicitly in relation to an older one in a way that simultaneously pays homage to that older technology while also arguing that it had insufficiencies and promising that the new media will fulfill the latent promise of the old one. 
is this kind of why like a CD looks like an LP? Yeah, there's a term in the design work called skeuomorphic design. <laughs> okay. <laughs> which is when the design of a thing continues to have features that are no longer functional, but that remind us of the old thing. So like sort of visually refers back. Yeah. So it continues to like it continues to to connect to those brain things. Like how save icons still look like floppy disks, even though young people have simply never seen a floppy disk in their lives. Exactly. I know. I know. And like icons for for phones still look like a telephone, yeah. sometimes with a rotary dial. Yeah, no, it's amazing. It's really amazing. Um, so rather than thinking of new media as like a radical break with the old, it's like it's not that video killed the radio star. It's that video remediated the radio star. I think I've have you have you said this before? I feel this sounds familiar. It's a it's a set of ideas you'll definitely have encountered because it's okay. it's sort of formative in media studies. Mm hmm. This is the process they call remediation. They talk a lot about digital film techniques in the book. It was published 23 years ago, so obviously they're pretty early digital film techniques, but, you know, they were new, so they're talking about them. So in the case of film, for example, they talk about how digital film techniques are positioned as fulfilling the promise of immersive realism that film itself sort of originally offered. So... Marcel, will you read, please, this quote from Bolter and Grusin, please? Quote, the supposed virtue of virtual reality, of video conferencing and interactive television and of the World Wide Web is that each of these technologies repairs the inadequacy of the medium or media that it now supersedes. In each case, that inadequacy is represented as a lack of of immediacy, and this seems to be generally true in the history of remediation. Photography was supposedly more immediate than painting, film than photography, television than film. And now, virtual reality fulfills the promise of immediacy and supposedly ends the progression. The rhetoric of remediation favors immediacy and transparency, even though as the medium matures, it offers new opportunities for hypermediacy. End quote. So tell me if I'm understanding this correctly, Hannah. I'm ready. What they're saying is that, as you already kind of parsed for us a little bit, each new media positions itself as like a new and improved version of the thing that came before but immediacy is like is like the goal it's like i don't know another word for immediate is that why me do does media come from immediate or does immediate come from media are these etymologically linked yeah oh my god i love etymology and it's all about like mediation right yeah. so the the media is a thing that comes in between you and reality of course. And immediacy is the quality of like or or a lack of mediation, the sense that oh. the mediation has fallen away and that you're experiencing the thing directly or transparently. OK, OK. Oh, that's so, it's so like interesting. The disappearance of mediation. So their point is that the goal of the progress of technology is actually the disappearance of mediation such that technology becomes fully transparent. Right. Like virtual reality. So that like you're the idea is that like we're constantly moving towards a kind of mediation that allows us to forget that what we're seeing is mediated and mistake it for reality. Because it can't fall away, right? Like like the mediation cannot disappear when we are using media to create this new lived experience. Yes, yes. You're only ever imagining it. Mediation is always mediation. Media is always yeah. media. But the yeah. goal of new media is to disappear. What do you mean by disappear? To render itself invisible from the perspective of the user experience. To be immersive such that you forget that what you are doing right now is experiencing something that is mediated and to mistake it for reality. Okay. And we get better and better at doing that all the time, mm -hmm. such that, for example, it's easier and easier to computer generate photographs of things that never happened. Creepy. Yes. Like, 
we treat photography as evidence of the real. Right. Because we have a tendency to forget that it's mediation. Okay. We do that all the time. We are constantly forgetting that the media that we're interacting with are media. Can I ask you a question about hypermediacy? Because I'm not sure that I understand what hypermediacy is. So hypermediacy and the relationship between hypermediacy and immediacy is really is really central to what Boulder and Grusin call the double logic of remediation. So I'm going to read you a quote now. They write, quote, Our culture wants both to multiply its media and to erase all traces of mediation. Ideally, it wants to erase its media in the very act of multiplying them, end quote. So we want media so advanced that we cease to perceive it as media and can fully mistake it for reality. But we also want to be aware of the technology and how cool and advanced it is. Okay. So this is what you were saying about Avatar and how they're like, isn't this cool? You forget that you're watching a movie. Here's how we made the movie that you're watching. Precisely. So digital filming techniques like motion capture offer that promise of film but better. Mm -hmm. So it's a remediation of film into a new medium, digital visual effects. Mm -hmm. And it's all about being like, it's film but more immersive, more real. It feels like you're there. It feels like all of the artificial things we're creating actually exist in reality. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, creators of digital visual effects are constantly, intensely hyping the effects themselves so that it's basically impossible to think about Avatar without picturing Zoe Saldana wearing a weird camera on her head. (laughs) Okay, okay, okay. So are these concepts like specific to, say, digital animation? Like, is it, is it, is this a a specifically now thing? Could this have existed? Could, could these ideas have existed before we started digital shit (laughs) for sure that's really central to their argument is that like new media in 2000 was digital media but that this logic of of remediation which is the tension between immediacy and hypermediacy has been the case since like perspectival painting came along and people were like whoa the things in the background are further away yeah whoa (laughs) whoa what (laughs) it is so funny to look at like early, early, early art before they had developed new techniques and be like, why did they think that people's faces look that way? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Why is everything just on the same plane? Because they hadn't come up with perspective yet. Incredible. They didn't, nobody had done that yet. So they, they give a really great example in the book that I think is so perfect for what we're talking about. So they go back to the era of early filmmaking And they quote film theorist Tom Gunning, who I think coined the term the cinema of attractions, which is like, I know it's like sexy cinema. It's not. Sounds like it's 18 plus. Going to the movie, like going to see cinema at the World Fair, where the cinema is a spectacle. Gotcha. So you're not going, they're like this predated narrative cinema, Mm -hmm. which is sort of dominated you know, the Hollywood era. It's like before Mm -hmm. cinema was a narrative form, it was just a thing that you looked at and were like, what? (laughs) Wait, what? What? (laughs) (laughs) That's my impression of people seeing movies. And and the probably the most famous example is the film uh, La Rive d'un Train en Gare de la Ciotat. You are, of course, familiar with this, with this famous film. I think, I, is it when the train is coming towards the audience and everybody starts screaming? Yeah. I say everybody starts screaming as though I was there. This is just what I imagine happened. Yeah, it's like probably an apocryphal story that people freaked out and fled mm-hmm. when they saw the train coming towards them. But like, certainly people were shocked and amazed mm-hmm. because the train seemed to be coming right at them. So mm-hmm. Boulder and Grusin and Gutting are like, probably, <laughs> probably they were... Probably audiences didn't run screaming from the theater. (laughs) But the point of a film like this, which is an example of the cinema of attractions, is that it's spectacular. Like, it's a spectacle. So it's about looking at a thing that you know can't be real. You're like, I know that's not a real train coming for me, but my eyes are telling me it's real. Mm -hmm. And that tension between the impression of reality 
that is the immediacy of the thing, and the obvious fabrication, the hypermediacy of the thing, is part of the pleasure. So remember what James Cameron said about wanting to create a movie where people can't tell the difference between what's real and what's not? Yes. That's cinema of, of attraction. This is like predominant cinema right now. Is that is that correct? It's the mode of the blockbuster in the 21st century. Yeah. So Bolter and Grusin argue that contemporary Hollywood blockbusters have returned to this tradition of the cinema of attractions. Their top examples are the other father of the modern CG blockbuster epic, Steven Spielberg. Mm-hmm. And they talk about Jurassic Park a lot in this book, which I actually didn't remember. And I am currently writing a book about Jurassic Park. And I was like, fuck, gotta get some Bolter and Grusin in that book. <laughs> anyway, so they argue that these blockbusters are returning to the tradition of the cinema of attractions by using a very loose narrative structure as a way to basically tie together a variety of visual set pieces designed, quote, to invoke a sense of wonder in the contemporary audience similar to what Gunning describes for the French audience in the Grand Café, end quote. So we know that what we're looking at, whether it's a train coming out of the screen or a mm-hmm. T-Rex stomping on a jeep or Mm -hmm. a sexy blue alien riding a dinosaur fucking a dinosaur fucking a dinosaur we know that isn't real Mm -hmm. but we are amazed at how real it appears and so the viewing experience is about that oscillation between being like it seems real i know it's not real it's amazing that a thing that's definitely not real seems real I am amazed by the technologies that are happening that produces a sense of realness, even though I know it's not real. It's that oscillation between immediacy and hypermediacy. That's the the viewing experience. So does hypermediacy need to need to be constantly changing in order to maintain that oscillation? Because I feel like part of me feels so jaded about certain things. Like I look at them and I'm like, well, it doesn't look real at all to me anymore because of my expectations. Yes, yes, yes. Because remediation is the logic of new media. Okay. So Hannah, I have another question. (laughs) What does this constant blurring of the real and the artificial, this intentional confusion of what's really real and what's computer generated do to our understanding? of actual reality. Yeah, not our understanding of media, our understanding of what actually exists in the world. Yeah. It's a great question, Marcel, and I would like us to spend some time on it in our final segment. All right, Hannah, please tell me, what will you do in this essay? Mm, I'm ready. Look at your long thesis. It's so long. We've got it. Like, we're going to have a real sort of fucking (laughs) escalation problem with this format. We're really going to have to get this shit under control. But not today. Not today. With its record-breaking box office of almost $3 billion, Avatar represents the apex of contemporary filmmaking massive blockbusters that lean heavily on digital effects and computer-generated graphics. The weakness of the plot is not an artistic failing, so much as it marks a return to the cinema of attractions, in which the audience gathers to marvel at the immersive immediacy of a film that is simultaneously so obviously artificial that it is undeniably hyper-mediated. The pleasures of hypermediacy are amplified by how much of the movie's promotional campaign centers on the technological advancements required to make it. This fixation on the technological production of artificial realities, however, produces a visual spectacle that deliberately distracts us from the material conditions of production that underpin contemporary blockbusters, including the exploitative labor conditions, ingrained sexism and racism, and devastating environmental impacts. In this essay, I will argue Oh my god. (laughs) Hannah? (laughs) Hannah! (laughs) 
you produce use technology to produce a new reel so we stop thinking about the actual reel oh my goodness this movie is a tra- is a trap life in digital production <laughs> is a function <laughs> yeah oh like the thing is <laughs> that in the movie he gets into a fake body yeah and that the fake body he's in is realer than the real world that he's in and the fake body lets him enter a fantastical immersive reality that the technology of the film itself also encourages us as viewers to imaginatively enter into so that people watching it in 3d were like blown away by the experience of like I basically feel like I have gone to Pandora. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the audience, so like, so like Jake Sully is the surrogate for the audience. Yeah. Right? Literally, Cameron said that he in part cast Sam Worthington because he hadn't been in any major films already. And he wanted a, guess what word? A. He wanted a nobody. He wanted a? Oh, no, he wanted an everyman. Yeah. (laughs) He literally said in one interview that Jake Sully felt like a guy you could have a beer with. (laughs) Disgusting. Is Sam Worthington disabled in real life? or No, No. absolutely not, Marcel. I'm sorry, Marcel. Do you know what an everyman is? I I don't. I don't. Clearly. It's a straight, white, cis, able-bodied American man. Who can be anyone (laughs) you can be anyone because that is the neutral version of humanity okay so this movie which we're not really going to talk we're not really going to talk about content i know i know but this movie which is about the ills of neocolonialism and racism is a movie that was made using military technologies but it's fine you can do you can use military technologies to do good things the movie shows us that because the avatar technology is literally military technology it's literally military technology that you put an explicitly imperfect human body into because what are the main human bodies we see experiencing it an old woman and a disabled man and a dweeb and a dweeb the three worst kinds of bodies you can have that was irony all of his bodies rule those are the bodies that we see put into the military machine and out comes fuckable aliens. It's literally the same technology as motion capture. It's just a narrative excuse to be like, you put a bad body in, you get a good body out. Oh, my God. Oh my military God. made it, but that's OK. The military's bad. But do not worry. We will use that technology for good. Trust us. Just trust us. It's fine. Just trust us. It's fine. What we're doing is good. Papa Dragon, very bad, but that's not real. That's extreme, imaginary, futuristic, definitely don't worry about it. You don't have to worry about the real military because the military that's represented here is so comically evil that it is not, definitely not a representation of, like, the real military. I heard somebody once. Now, I want to say this was Aaron Keefe talking on the podcast hey riddle riddle i might be mistaking it but i but i think it was uh saying that avatar is military propaganda Mm -hmm. and her co-hosts were like don't be absurd the military are the bad guys and kind of like 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 laughed (laughs) laughed at her Mm -hmm. and i was Mm -hmm. like no this movie is military propaganda for fucking sure Mm -hmm. absolutely Mm -hmm. it is Mm -hmm. and that you know the point of like the way in which it is military propaganda is that it makes the military look cool like it's making cool machines. Right, 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 right. It's making good machines that when a good white guy who's on the right side of history uses it, like he's a good Marine. The fact that he's a Marine Mm -hmm. is part of what makes him able to identify, right? He's a warrior. They're warriors. They connect through being warriors. And he does prove to hot grace that he can in fact do the same work as his presumably soft boy intellectual of a brother yeah he didn't need that fucking school you don't need fucking school 
You don't need fucking school. You don't school. need to be nerd. You need to be a jock. Being a jock is what makes you succeed in life. Fucking nerds, they die. Oh, no, they do, though. Yeah, they sure do. They do. Oh, boy. Marcel, have you been following, speaking of of labor and cinema, have you been following mm-hmm. what's going on with the writer's strike right now? Shout out to the to the writers and actors on strike right now because yeah, Hollywood union strong. Everybody go on fucking strike. <laughs> Hollywood cannot afford to pay its writers because <laughs> clearly they need all that money for their marketing budgets and their motion capture budgets. Yeah, absolutely. Can't pay writers. Can't pay, you know, most like. Okay. Most actors. I know some actors make a lot of money, but like not most of them. <laughs> Part of why they don't want to spend money on real people is that they're pretty sure any day now they'll be able to do all of it with computers. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a really interesting, this was, you know, I, I simply didn't have time to get into this, but that late 90s piece on motion capture is really obsessed with the question of whether it's artistry or not. Mm, And mm -hmm. that sort of partially comes out of the world of animation, where, like, hand cell animation used to be the sort of ideal of animation. It's become computer animation now. And some animators will say, like, well, it's just, you know, if it's computer generated, it's not not really art. Mm -hmm. But part of that conversation also comes from, like, the motion capture of actors like are is that real acting mm-hmm. if we're not not actually going to see your face on screen and a lot of the sort of accompanying paratext for avatar emphasizes like cameron wanting to be like this is real acting and real directing right like right. i am capturing the nuances of their performances on camera and then we are sup- like they really really want it to come across as real art. Yeah. But arguably part of trying to position computer generated work as real art contributes to an argument through which we will gradually be able to replace people with computers Mm -hmm. at the performance level. Mm -hmm. Right. So content generation comes out of computers, which means that studios get to own it. Mm -hmm. And then where humans work is like in the rendering plants Mm -hmm. where they can be mistreated because they're they're not talent They're Or they can be rewarded with Porn Friday. Or they can be rewarded with Porn Friday. A really great point. A really great point. All the porn you can eat. The thing that just, you know, keeps jumping out at me, though, is that like the people at the top aren't replacing themselves and they literally do nothing they do they do nothing excuse me they take personal submersibles to the bottom of the ocean you're right they're doing important work they are trying to fuck a lake james cameron did lots and lots of technological development funding i I was talking to a friend about this movie and she was like i mean you got to admit it's pretty cool and i'm like yeah no the technology is really cool I don't think James Cameron should have this amount of money. And she mm. was like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, of course. No, of course, it's a nightmare. <laughs> of, of course, course no of question. Course, of course. No question. It's a nightmare that just rich white men get to decide what technology will be. Exactly. Particularly when, uh, tip to Marshall McLuhan, the technologies that we have reshape our reality. Indeed. And so our reality is being actively reshaped by the whims of rich white men and the things they think are cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 And guess what they think is cool? <laughs> <sighs> Fucking blue aliens. <laughs> Material Girls is a Witch Please production and is distributed by Acast. You can find the rest of our episodes and our other podcasts on Acast or at ohwitchplease.ca. Here are some other things you can do at ohwitchplease.ca. You can sign up for our amazing newsletter, read our transcripts, check out our merch, find reading lists for our episodes, and learn more about our Patreon. If you have questions, comments, concerns, or praise, especially praise, we love praise, come hang out with us at ohwitchplease on Instagram or Twitter or threads or 
on TikTok at a witch please pod. You can also check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash a witch please. Special thanks to everyone on the Witch Please Productions team, including our digital content coordinator, Gabby Iori, our social media manager and marketing designer, Zoe Mix, our sound engineer, Eric Magnus, and of course, our executive producer, Hannah Rehack, aka Coach. We also started a Substack. Every month, we're offering a look behind the episode. I, Marcel, I wrote our first stack, that's what they're called, and it was all about my experience doing research for our Barbie by Petrocapitalism episode. To subscribe to our Substack, head over to ohwhichplease.substack.com. Or ohwhichplease.ca, where you can sign up for a Substack. Now that has to be true before this episode goes out. At the end of every episode, we will thank everyone who has joined our Patreon or boosted their tier to help make our work possible. This week, our enormous gratitude goes out to Devin C., Kate T., Alz D D, Claire B., Melissa E., Marike G., Aislin or Ashlyn, Morgan J, Damian L, Lily T, Lily Tomlin, Rachel R, and our first top tier, apologetic billionaire, Elizabeth Schweisenberg. Schweinsberg? 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 Elizabeth Schweinsberg. Oh my God. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. The only billionaire we've ever known. The only billionaire we don't want to eat. The only billionaire we truly love. We'll be back next episode to tackle another piece of pop culture through a whole new theoretical lens. But until then... Later, avatators. 